can change this. So the next talk is a, a asymptotically quasi-optimal cryptography, and uh, Leo de Castro will give a talk. Uh, these are the other slides. Uh, this one. Uh, the AQO slides, I downloaded them here. I, I Great, thanks. All right. Hi, uh, so this, this talk is on uh, asymptotically quasi-optimal crypt cryptography. Uh, this is joint work with uh, wonderful co-authors, Carmit, Yuval, Vinod, and Muthu. Um, so in this talk, uh, we're going to introduce the notion of asymptotically quasi-optimal crypt cryptography, and um, we're gonna give new techniques to con construct AQO crypto, and in particular, we're gonna be focusing on uh, semi-honest uh, two-party computation. And also uh, we're going to um, briefly talk about constructions for uh, malicious verifier zero, zero knowledge and um, how to build that from uh, sender rate one AQO batch OLE. Uh, so this talk is motivated by this fundamental question of what is the overhead of cryptography. So if we consider a cry cryptographic problem of size n, such as uh, securely sending a message of length n over a public channel or performing a batch o OT or batch OLE of length n, uh, or uh, proving the satisfiability of a linear size circuit with n inputs in zero knowledge, uh, all of these, well, can be insecurely solved uh, with order n communication and computation. Uh, so what about the secure so solution with uh, security parameter lambda? Well, the most uh, natural solutions usually have a multiplicative overhead. Uh, so you have something like order n times poly lambda, where you, know, you need to do roughly poly lambda work for each instance of your problem. Uh, the work of uh, Ishai Kushilevitz, uh, oh, Strosky and uh, Hai uh, showed an uh, amortized overhead where um, you have some polynomial in lambda and once uh, your problem size becomes big enough, uh, the overhead of the cryptography is just amortized over uh, all the extra problem instances. But the problem is that this polynomial is unspecified. So it could be quite large and it could be quite a while before your amortized uh, efficiency really kicks in. So you could hope for the best possible overhead uh, which in most cases is just n plus lambda. Uh, you can sometimes do better in uh, uh, communication, but um, in general, n plus lambda is the best that you can ho hope for. Uh, 
Uh, so the problem is that asymptotic optimality is actually uh, quite hard to uh, achieve. Uh, we don't even have uh, heuristic constructions for public key in in encryption. Uh, so we're going to settle for asymptotic quasi-optimal overhead, which is O tilde of n plus lambda. So we're going to uh, allow for uh, polylog factors, but this is going to get us within polylog factors of the best possible solution. Uh, so this is our stated goal, uh, solve size n cryptographic problems with uh, O tilde n plus lambda complexity. Uh, so what was known before this uh, work? Some crypto problems did have AQO solutions. Um, Lots of solutions for secure key in encryption. Basically, any uh, secure PRF is going to give you a good uh, secure key in encryption solution. Uh, for AQO public key encryption, um, ring learning with errors is the main assumption that uh, we have. This is going to be the main uh, assumption that the rest of the, of the talk is going to be focused on. If all you care about is AQO communication, uh, elliptic curves will uh, give you this, but because of uh, um, the exponentiation, you're, you're not going to be able to get a QO compu computation. Uh, similarly, with uh, Schring OT, elliptic curves and ring learning with errors are, are the main assumptions. And additively homomorphic encryption, uh, you can also get from ring learning with errors. This is not for the function private version of this uh, primitive. We're going to be talking about function privacy later. Uh, so in our work, we construct lots of AQO uh, primitives, but uh, the focus of this talk will be batch OLE. And uh, all of our constructions are going to be relying on ring learn learning with error. So uh, let's jump into some brief background. Uh, what is batch OLE? Uh, it's a two-party protocol between a sender Alice and a receiver Bob. Alice has two vectors A and B. Bob has a vector X. At the end of the protocol, Alice gets nothing. And Bob uh, gets the result A times X plus B, where all the arithmetic operations are component-wise. Um, this is a fundamental building block of arithmetic MPC. And um, there are lots of special cases of this protocol that are very well studied. Uh, there's OLE, which is just uh, where everything is a scalar. Um, there's vector OLE, where A, B, and the output are all vectors, but Bob's input X is just a scalar. Um, and then this is, you can view this as an arithmetic uh, analog of OT. You can get back to OT by just setting your plain text modulus equal to two. Uh, just very brief background on ring learning with errors. Uh, we have our polynomial ring, uh, which uh, is mod up a uh, degree n polynomial. So our polynomials will have degree n minus one, so they'll be represented by uh, vectors of length n. And uh, the ring LWE assumption states that uh, these two distributions on the left and right here are not distinguishable. So in, in, in particular, this uh, second polynomial in the output on the left is, a very, is very close to a linear function in A, with the end uh, on the right is just uniformly random. Uh, very briefly, what we're going to uh, define additively homomorphic in encryption. Uh, all of the AHE uh, schemes that we'll be looking at today will be uh, single instruction multiple data. So all the ciphertexts are going to encrypt vectors of elements, and all the arithmetic operations will be component-wise. So like SIMD uh, encrypted addition will take two in encrypted vectors, A and B, and output an encryption of the component-wise sum of A and B. Same thing with plain text addition. Uh, it's just that the operand B is in the clear. And similarly, for plain text multiplication, uh, it's just component-wise multiplication between A and B. Uh, right, so how do we get AHE from ring learning with errors? Uh, most of you have probably seen this, but if, if not, uh, the uh, ciphertext has the structure, uh, the second polynomial has the structure di diagrammed here where uh, it has this mask, A times S, that's taken away during D decryption. And what's left is this uh, polynomial here that has this large gap in the middle. The message bits are pushed to the top by the scaling factor delta. The error bits live in the bottom. And there's this big space in the middle to allow the error to grow. Uh, so when you have a ciphertext that looks like this, ciphertext addition becomes very easy. Uh, you take the two ciphertexts and you just add them uh, component-wise. Plain text addition uh, in the same way, really. Plain text multiplication is a simple uh, operation, but maybe less simple in its implications. So again, we're just going to like do the natural thing of just multiplying through uh, the plain text M prime uh, by our ciphertext. So this gives us an encryption of M times M prime, but the problem now is that we have this error term that depends on M prime. And so if you were to give the ciphertext back to someone who knew the original error term, uh, 
you're going to leak M, M prime to that party. And so this is a problem if you care about function privacy. And if you want to achieve function privacy, you have to hide this noise term in, in some way. Uh, the classic way of doing this, uh, I believe this dates all the way back to uh, Gentry's uh, original paper, is uh, noise flooding. Uh, which is really just adding a noise term that's lambda bits larger than the error term you're trying to hide. Uh, so this, this works well, but it requires uh, lambda extra bits of space in that gap between the message and the error. And so uh, this is going to be a problem if we try to construct AQO uh, batch OLE just from this uh, straightforward AHG scheme. Uh, so let's take a look at this protocol. Uh, so Bob is going to uh, encrypt his input X uh, and Alice is then going to take her input and evaluate the uh, plaintext ciphertext multiplication and plaintext ciphertext addition on Bob's ciphertext. This is going to generate an, an encryption of the OLE result. And uh, then Alice is going to flood the ciphertext with noise. And so what, what Bob gets back is going to look like this. So the, uh, the uh, message bits in the top will have the OLE result. And in the bottom is going to need to be enough space for Alice's flooding noise. And so the original error term had roughly the, the um, uh, log, log p bits from the multiplication. And then you need another lambda bits on top of that for the flooding noise. So this gives you a multiplicative n times lambda overhead. So this is not a, a QO. Uh, so we need to fix this problem if we want to use this uh, approach uh, for an AQO OLE. So let's uh, try to fix this. Let's uh, uh, try to uh, ease the uh, uh, amount of noise that we're adding in this scheme. Uh, so let's go through this toy example that will illustrate this idea that we call gentle noise flooding. So uh, let's start with some number e that we're going to try to try to hide. We just know that e is in some range, say 0 to 10. And then we're going to have a noise term between uh, 0 and 20, that's just going to be one extra bit of E. It's not going to be lambda bits more than E. It's just going to be one more bit than, than E. And our noisy uh, output is going to be just E plus eta. Uh, and so the challenge is going to be, can you actually guess E given T? So sometimes this is going to be easy. Uh, when uh, T is 0, there's only one set of E and and uh, eta that will be uh, that will be able to give this t output, and so okay, this is not great. But uh, if t is ten, then uh, you have something a little bit more interesting. You have uh, a value of, of eta for every possible value of e, and so you could argue that e is hidden, and you can actually formalize this by saying if t is in this middle range of possible values, then e is actually perfectly hidden. Uh, so if you repeat this this game n times, you have a bunch of secret e's and a bunch of uh, noise terms eta, and you give uh, some party a bunch of uh, values t at ti, you can uh, formalize uh, some toy version of our gentle noise flooding lemma by saying, OK, actually, uh, we know that at least half of our secret EIs are going to be hidden. Uh, so this is good. It means that we're hiding something. Uh, so let's look at uh, what happens if Alice just uses a gentle flooding term as opposed to a uh, regular flooding noise term in this uh, AHE protocol. So Bob does this, the same thing. Uh, he in, encrypts his input X. Alice does the same thing to generate the, in, the encryption of the OLE output. But now, instead of adding a flooding term, she adds just a gentle flooding term. And so what Bob gets, gets back is a ciphertext that needs a lot less space between the message and the error, because the noise term that Alice adds is a lot smaller. Uh, this is smaller both concretely and asymptotically. Uh, and the only downside is that now uh, some of Alice's uh, A in input is actually leaked. Um, so uh, we need one extra idea to fix this. And the final idea here really is to use an OLE ex extractor, which is this really cool protocol that uh, takes uh, leaky o OLEs uh, for some bound on the leakage and turns them into truly random o o OLEs. Uh, we instantiate this extractor using the work of uh, Block, Gupta, Maji, and Nguyen uh, with read Solomon codes to maintain our quasi-linear computation, which, which we need for AQO. And then once you have random o OLEs, this is basically good enough for any uh, OLE application. You can turn them into arbitrary OLEs. You can use them in other uh, protocols. This is, uh, we're going to say that we're done once we have random OLEs. OK, so what's our full AQO batch OLE protocol? We start with the folklore OLE protocol from additively homomorphic in, 
encryption, we use a random A, B, and X, and we replace the flooding term with a gentle flooding term. Uh, so this will allow us to add only like uh, uh, log n, roughly uh, log n extra bits of noise per term. And this will give us a bound on the number of leaked coordinates, uh, call it L. And, and L is going to be order order lambda. So we only have uh, order lambda coordinates leaked with very high prob prob probability. And then we can take this leakage bound L and oh, what did I do? Oh, uh, we can take this leakage bound L and uh, plug it into the uh, OLE ex extractor to uh, get our random OLEs out. Uh, the nice thing about this protocol is that it's very concretely efficient. It's actually uh, com competitive with uh, other state-of-the-art batch OLE protocols. And this was very surprising because semi-honest batch OLE has been like optimized uh, like crazy. And so to just kind of start with this very nice theoretical question and to end up with a uh, con concretely efficient protocol uh, is a very motivating uh, result. It, it, it suggests that this AQO problem can uh, be this bridge from theory to concrete efficiency. Uh, okay, but um, I said at the beginning, we're going to talk about maliciously secure two-party computation, and this AQO protocol, uh, even though it's fast, is uh, only semi-honest. Uh, and in fact, if Bob is malicious, there's a pretty uh, simple attack. If Bob sends a malformed ciphertext, then Alice's full input could still be leaked. So if we want a maliciously secure batch OLE protocol, we're going to need to do something else. Uh, so it uh, didn't render right. Um, the uh, the 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 next uh, bit of the of the talk is going to um, focus on this malicious re receiver batch OLE pr protocol. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the malicious receiver batch OT protocol that we can build from the batch OLE protocol, and then I'll talk very briefly about the AQO uh, zero knowledge from the batch OT. And uh, for the uh, two-party secure computation, I'll re re refer you to the paper. Okay, so um, as we said, uh, there's an attack where if Bob sends a malformed ciphertext, uh, Alice's input can be totally leaked. So if we uh, want to defend against a malicious Bob, we need to say that for any ciphertext that uh, Bob sends, at least some of Alice's input is going to be hidden. So uh, there's lots of prior works on protocols like this. Uh, they're usually called uh, just, uh, statistically sender private OT or OLE. But for the reasons that we uh, uh, talked about at the beginning, uh, none of these are AQO. Uh, so we want to think about like how much information does the resulting ciphertext leak about Alice's input. And the simple, the simple upper bound here is just the number of extra bits that Alice sends beyond the output. So Alice has some output that she's trying to communicate to Bob. This is, this is M. And then there's, there's just going to be extra bits in the ciphertext. And we're just going to call all of these extra bits, say, in the worst case, they're going to all leak information about Alice's input. And so we're just going to bound the uh, leakage on uh, Alice's input by the number of extra bits in the ciphertext. So the goal here then is to get less bits of leakage than are in Alice's input. And if we have this, then we can say, okay, at least some of Alice's input must be hidden. Uh, so the plaintext modulus log P uh, could only be slightly smaller than the ciphertext modulus log Q. If we had a ciphertext modulus that was only a little bit bigger, then this would suffice. The problem is that uh, naively we, we, we need uh, log Q to be greater than log P for correctness because we need space for the error to grow for the OLE multiplication. Uh, but there's a standard trick to fix this. Uh, it's called modulus re reduction. Uh, so you start with a, a large modulus uh, that's bigger than twice the plaintext modulus. Then you finish the OLE compu computation. And then when you're finished all of the computations, you just reduce the modulus down and uh, you end up with this much smaller modulus that is uh, smaller than twice the plaintext modulus. So this is fine. But the second challenge now is that our ciphertext actually has two polynomials. So even though we have a, a, a small ciphertext modulus, uh, the fact that we have two ciphertext polynomials means that uh, Alice's input could be uh, totally leaked in the second polynomial. Remember, Alice has uh, two polynomials as her input, uh, A and 
B, um, really, if the A input is uh, leaked, then so is everything else. So um, really, uh, we want to pre prevent uh, Alice's A input from leaking. And it could be that uh, all of Alice's input leaks in uh, the second ciphertext polynomial. So we, we uh, naively need two log Q bits uh, for this ciphertext. But uh, we can actually get a better rate on this ciphertext um, by reusing this uh, first term, uh, k k time. So in, instead of just, just encrypting one polynomial m, we're going to encrypt k polynomials and just reuse the same first ciphertext polynomial in uh, the rest of these encryptions. So, so now our rate is uh, k uh, times log, log p, which is our uh, message, uh, over uh, k plus 1 times log q, which is the number of polynomials. So uh, the question is now, how do we actually get the ciphertext as a result? And uh, the answer is to uh, use a uh, vector of uh, secret keys and uh, to write the message as a matrix with the messages just on the uh, diagonal. The ciphertext is going to look like a matrix of polynomials that is... Uh, uh, k by k for the mask of the message, and then there's going to be one extra column for the uh, uh, first um, polynomials, and then this, this whole thing is going to get uh, masked by error. And so you might say, oh, wait, this doesn't look AQO anymore, but actually it will be because k is going to only be poly log lambda. Uh, so uh, at the end, though, um, we, if we uh, have the sender input also be k polynomials, then uh, we can get this ciphertext as the result just by multiplying this matrix by uh, Alice's um, vector of polynomials as her input. Uh, so this is good. So now we have our output, output ciphertext that's very high rate. And the point is that the number of extra bits in this output ciphertext is less than Alice's input. Uh, and as we said, uh, k is going to be polylog uh, in n and lambda. So everything is still a QO. And uh, this is an AQO batch OLE protocol uh, with security against a malicious Bob. Uh, OK, so then, then just very briefly, um, the way that we get uh, batch OT from uh, batch OLE is we start with uh, n OLEs over some uh, prime p, and then uh, we factor uh, this uh, composite that's uh, slightly, uh, that's uh, slightly uh, larger than uh, p, and then we um, re reduce over this composite, and this gives us uh, uh, tau um, OTs mod each, uh, or sorry, tau OLEs mod each prime, and then we we convert each uh, OLE to an OT using the uh, standard reduction. Um, I'm, I believe I'm I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Questions? You kind of use a uh, the two component ciphertext, then you kind of do this trick with the with the fixed A and then many many yeah things, yeah. yeah to get the thing. Couldn't you just use entry? Because then you just only have one ciphertext component to get the same com uh, compression. Uh. Possibly. We didn't, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how entry would work in terms of the AQO parameters, but that would be interesting if uh, you could, if you could use that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.